author and international speaker, Jay Siegert holds degrees in both physics and engineering technology. As founder of the Starting Point Project, Jay passionately seeks to help people establish a biblical worldview based on the authority of scripture. For more than 30 years, he has been graciously tackling tough questions regarding the Christian faith, especially in the often intimidating world of science bringing it down to a level that everyone can understand. We trust you will enjoy this presentation as Jay delivers a fascinating talk entitled, Inspiration of the Bible. Well, thanks for joining us on this five session seminar series on the inspiration of the Bible. We are in session two right now, moving right along. Session one, we did the first part of the introduction. This session, we're going to finish off the introduction. There's just a lot of foundational information that we want to share along the way. After that, we're going to get into those four lines of evidence showing us that we can be very confident that the Bible truly is the inspired Word of God. Session one, we discussed what exactly is the Bible, and we talked about the different versions that are out there. In this session, we're going to discuss how and when the Bible is written, who decided what was included, was it copied accurately, and then we'll discuss the miraculous survival of the Bible throughout time. So let's jump right in and talk about how and when the Bible was written. The how and when, we're going to start out actually with the how. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. I wanted to finish that out and go into the next verse because too often we, we skip that. The reason God gave us this is so that we can be perfect. It doesn't mean sinless. It just means complete. And so that we can be furnished with everything that we need to do what God wants us to do. But the main portion here is that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. God is the one who is driving all of this. We also have 2 Peter 121. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Again, the focus here is that they weren't just making this up and writing things down that they thought were good. They were moved by the Spirit of God to write everything that they wrote. Now, God allowed their personality to come through and their writing styles, but He made sure that everything they wrote was what He wanted it to be. And they wrote on various materials. They certainly didn't write on college line paper or iPads and tablets like that. This is what they wrote on. They wrote on stone and clay tablets, wood, leather, papyrus, vellum, wax tablets. These materials don't last forever. That's one of the reasons why it had to be copied over and over. And we'll be getting into those details in the second part of this introductory session here. So when was it written? Good question. The Old Testament was penned roughly 1500 to 400 BC, and the New Testament was written roughly about 40 to 100 AD. So you can plot that there on your timeline. This is, this is when the writers were actually writing these things down. All right, so who decided what was included? This is another really hot topic and a question that Christians need to have a good response for because skeptics ask this question. It's a very natural question for them to be wondering about. So that leads us to talk about the canonization. It's just a big word meaning the collection of books that are there, the 66 books that we discussed, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. The long answer to this question is go read a book. And I'm not saying that sarcastically. I mean, it's a long answer in that it would take a lot of research. There are volumes and volumes written on this information. And it's kind of interesting, but it's probably more than we need for this series. But if you're interested in that topic, there's a lot covering the details of that. And we don't need to do that. We're going to focus mostly on the short answer. But I'll give you a few highlights before we get to the short answer. The Old Testament, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch that Moses wrote, were established early in Jewish history. The rest, as they were written, ending in roughly 400 to 450 B.C. The Council of Jamnia in 90 A.D. officially recognized the 39 books that we have today for the Old Testament. 
That's just when they officially recognize it. It's not that they became inspired at that point. It's just the first time that they sat down and said, okay, this is what we're recognizing as being part of the Old Testament, the New Testament. We have Athanasius of Alexandria provided us with the first official list in 367 AD. Again, it's just the first time they had an official list. It wasn't that the writings weren't inspired until then. It's just that at that point, they were actually officially writing it down. Now, there were five tests of canonicity to the writings for the New Testament, just meaning as they were discussing what they believed were inspired, they had five tests. At that time, there was a lot of persecution going on. They wanted to make sure that they weren't dying over some book that people didn't really even consider inspired. So they kind of wanted to sit down and make sure they were all on the same page as to which books were inspired and which weren't. One of those tests was, was the book authoritative? Secondly, was it prophetic? Meaning, was it based on the testimony of an apostle? Thirdly, was it consistent with other revelation of truth? Fourth, did it demonstrate God's life-changing power? And lastly, was it accepted and used by believers? Now, these tests, you may notice, are kind of subjective. Like, well, was it accepted and used by other believers? Well, did you have to have 90% acceptance, 98, 99? And what was the cutoff? It is a little subjective. Did it come with life-changing power? Well, how do you really judge that? Yes, these tests do seem kind of subjective, which leads us to discussing the short answer. The short answer as to which books were included is this. It was supernatural and logical. So think about this. It would make no sense for God to create this entire universe, put human beings on this planet, communicate with them, have them write some things down, and then later as they went to collect them, they're making a mess of things, and God's like, oh, my word, hey, you guys, you forgot about this one. This is one of my best ones, and you didn't even get that one. And what are you doing with that one? That one's kind of a joke. Why would you include that? Ah, now it's all messed up. That wouldn't make any sense that God would allow that to happen. It makes a lot more sense that God would supernaturally, just as he guided the original writers, he would guide these men to make sure that they got the books collected that were the ones that were inspired by him. So it's just very logical that God would supernaturally do this. Now he used humans to do that, so yes, they had their counsels, they had their tests and all that, but above and beyond all that was God supernaturally working their lives to make sure that what we have today is what he originally inspired in those writers. Bruce Metzger, American Bible scholar, has a very interesting quote. He said, you have to understand that the canon was not the result of a series of contests involving church politics. You see, the canon is a list of authoritative books more than it is an authoritative list of books. I'm going to repeat that because it's so important. The canon is a list of authoritative books more than it is an authoritative list of books. These documents didn't derive their authority from being selected. Each one was authoritative before anyone gathered them together. And that's the important point. They were inspired as these writers were penning them to begin with. Later they were collected, but they were inspired from the beginning, not later as they were decided upon as being inspired word of God. But what about the Apocrypha? Some of you are wondering, yeah, what about the Apocrypha? Others of you are wondering, what's the Apocrypha? So let's talk about that briefly. The Apocrypha is a collection of about 14 books written between the close of the Old Testament and the opening of the New Testament, again, roughly about 400 B.C. to around 40 A.D. And here are the books. We have Ecclesiasticus, Wisdom, First and Second Maccabees, and so on. Fourteen books written between the Old and the New Testament. The word Apocrypha actually means hidden. Volume-wise, it's about equivalent to the writings in the New Testament. It never claims divine inspiration for itself. This is very important. It's never saying, thus saith the Lord, that this actually comes from God. It doesn't make that claim for itself. Also, it's never referred to by Jesus or the apostles. That's pretty significant. And it was always rejected by the Jews. They never accepted it as being part of inspired word of God. It contains different doctrine and practices. This is Tobit 12.9. For almsgiving saves from death and purges every sin. Those who give alms will enjoy a full life. 
Well, that's certainly contrary to the teaching of the Word of God that our salvation is by faith alone. It's not by works or us giving money. So that can't be the inspired Word of God. It also contains historical errors. This is from Baruch 6.2. And when you are come into Babylon, you shall be there many years and for a long time even to seven generations, and after that I will bring you away from thence with peace. While we know the Israelites were not in Babylon for seven generations, they were there for 70 years. That's what we learn in Jeremiah 25, 11. So here's a historical era, era in the apocryphal writings. And there's nothing new in here that's adding to God's truth other than some contradictions. There's no new truth that we need from the apocrypha. And there's no objective evidence for its divine authority, not like the rest of Scripture where it makes claims that can actually be tested in showing evidence of supernatural inspiration. It's interesting as the Roman Catholic Council of Trent in 14, 1546 approved them as inspired by God, except for First and Second Estrus and the prayer of Manasseh. It's also interesting as that's right when Martin Luther was making some complaints saying, hey, you guys, a lot of what you're teaching is not in Scripture. So then the Catholic Church and councils conveniently decided to adopt the Apocrypha into the inspired Word of God because the Apocrypha does support some of their teachings. But I think that was their motivation there was when Luther was saying, no, this stuff is not scriptural. And he made a, a big stink about it in a sense, and it kind of changed religious history there. Now, even with all those legitimate concerns, it's still the Apocrypha does contain some useful historical commentary between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New. It tells us a lot about what was going on with different nations, so we can at least learn some things from it, even though it isn't the inspired Word of God. Was the Bible copied accurately? Another great question. Well, they certainly didn't have Xerox machines back then to just crank out these copies. So how was it copied? Well, the skeptics will talk about the telephone game, and you may have heard this claim. You may have played this game before where one person whispers something to someone else, and they in turn whisper that to the next person, the next all the way on down the line, around the circle. By the time it gets to the end, it's completely distorted. For example, the person might say, my elbow is starting to hurt a bit. And by the time it gets to the end, it might turn out to be, Milo just ate a Hershey's kiss. Kind of a funny game to play. But this is seriously what the skeptics will claim. Of course that what we have today isn't what the Bible writers originally wrote because it's just been handed down verbally over time over the years and things get corrupted and they get changed. And if that's what had happened back then, then I would say, yeah, that's pretty good argumentation that it could easily have gotten corrupted. But that's not how the Bible was copied over time. That leads us to talk about how it actually was copied and the rules. And you can ask the skeptic, hey, what rules did they use when they were copying Scripture? Can you tell me a little bit about that? Why you're so confident that they were really messing things up along the way? Well, the vast majority of skeptics won't know anything about the rules. They just heard from someone else that it's been copied so many times throughout history that what we have today isn't what was originally written. So let's take a look at some of these rules. We'll focus on the Old Testament with the time that we have. Here were the rules that they used in copying the Old Testament Scriptures. Number one, the synagogue roll must be written on the skins of clean animals prepared for a particular use in the synagogue by a Jew. Secondly, these must be fastened together with strings taken from clean animals containing a certain number of columns equal throughout the entire codex. Third, each column length must not span less than 48 or more than 60 lines, and the breadth must consist of 30 letters. Fourth, the entire copy must be lined first, and if three words are written without a line, it will be considered worthless. Fifth, the ink should be black, not any other color, and has to be prepared according to a specific recipe. Sixth, the source document must be perfect, and the transcriber cannot deviate from it in the least. Seventh, no word or letter, not even a yod, meaning a small portion of a letter, must be written from memory, the scribe not having looked at the codex before him. Eighth, must have the space of a hair or thread between every consonant. The Old Testament and Hebrew, they only had consonants. They didn't have vowels, so all these letters were only consonants, and they had to have these spaces between each one. 
ninth, must have the space of nine consonants between every paragraph or section. Tenth, must have the space of three lines between every book. Eleventh, the fifth book of Moses, Deuteronomy, must end exactly with a line, but not necessary for the rest. Twelfth, the copyist must sit in full Jewish attire, wash his entire body, and not begin to write the name of God with a pen that has been newly dipped in ink. I think it was probably because you didn't want it to blotch, and they had a lot of respect for writing the name of God. So much so that leads us to the last one here. If addressed by a king while writing the name of God, the scribe must not pay any attention to him. This just gives you a little feel for what they went through in copying the word of God. So far from just whispering it in someone's ear and getting it corrupted over time, they had very, very strict rules. They pretty much guaranteed when they were done, that copy was an exact of the original. But they didn't just stop there, they went even further. We had the Masoretic copyists, a special group of people who also copied scripture, and they had their own rules here. They numbered verses, words, and letters of every book. They calculated the middle word and the middle letter of each, and they carried out additional numeric calculations and did cross-checks. Hebrew letters have numeric values to them, so they could go to the original writing. They could add up all the numbers associated with those letters, then go to their copy and add up all those numbers. That better be the exact value or something was off, and they'd have to correct it. They could calculate the very middle letter, the middle word, and all these things, all these numeric cross-checks. So when they were done, they were absolutely sure that the copy was a perfect replica of the original one. And then as that original one would start to wear out, they could get rid of it. In fact, you don't want a bad copy circulating because people might misread it. So once they knew they had a perfect copy, you can get rid of the old one, and now you have a perfect copy. Rather than being distorted, it's perfect because of all the rules that they used. Then we have modern scribes called sophers. A sopher must know more than 4,000 Judaic laws before beginning to write a Torah scroll. That's pretty serious because that's how serious they take working with and handling the Word of God. Then we have the Dead Sea Scrolls. This has been called the greatest manuscript find of all time. I'm sure you've heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls. You might not know that much about them. They were discovered in the Qumran Caves in Israel. Three shepherd boys were tending their sheep, and they were throwing rocks up into the caves. And when they did, they heard shattering of like clay pots. They came back early the next morning and climbed up into the caves, and they found these pots filled with various manuscripts. It was amazing. So the whole discovery was between 1947 and 1956, as they went back and discovered more and more. It consists of 800 documents and tens of thousands of fragments dating from about 250 B.C., to 68 A.D. Every book in the Old Testament is represented except for the book of Esther. That's very, very impressive. Scrolls were written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Well, no coincidence because those are the original languages of the Bible, Old and New Testament. Prior to the discovery of these scrolls, the oldest complete copy of the Old Testament in Hebrew was from 1008 A.D. That's more than 1,400 years after the Old Testament was originally completed. A big gap from the time of the original writing to when we actually had a copy. But the Dead Sea Scrolls take us over 1,000 years closer to the originals, and it shows us how accurately they've been copied. It greatly aided in confirming the accurate transmission of the biblical texts throughout history. Here's a quote from Dr. Gleason Archer, a biblical scholar, talking about one of these scrolls called the Isaiah scroll. He said, Isaiah proved to be word for word identical with our standard Hebrew Bible in more than 95% of the text. The 5% of variation consisted chiefly of obvious slips of the pen and variations in spelling. They do not affect the message of Revelation in the slightest. And then we have a quote from Dr. Kenneth Boa, president of Reflections Ministry. He said, because of the thousands of New Testament manuscripts, there are many variant readings. Nevertheless, only a small number of these differences affect the sense of the passages, and only a fraction of these have any real consequences. Furthermore, no variant readings are significant enough to call into question any of the doctrines of the New Testament. The New Testament can be regarded as 99.5% pure, 
and the correct reading for the remaining 0.5% can often be ascertained with a fair degree of probability by the practice of textual criticism, which we'll talk about in just a little bit here. So these manuscript copies, we've got a lot of manuscript copies of the Bible, which we're going to take a look at. And here is a chart of manuscript evidence for other ancient writings. This is called the bibliographical test, looking at manuscripts to see how confident can we be that what we have today is what the original writers wrote, whether it's the Bible or other ancient writings. We have, first of all, here at the top of the list, Homer, that was written about 800 B.C. Well, there's a 400-year interval from the original writing in 800 B.C. to when we have any copies. And the number of manuscripts, MSS means manuscripts, we have 1,800. That's actually pretty good. Used to be a lot lower, but recently we've discovered a lot more. So about 400 years have gone by from the original writings to when we have copies, but they have a fair amount of copies. Then we have Sealer's Gallic Wars. There's almost a thousand year gap from the original writing to when we have manuscripts, and we only have 251 copies. That's not very many. We're not going to look at all of these in detail here. We'll just pick out one more for now. Thucydides, um, that's about a 200 year interval. It's a shorter interval here, but there are only 96 copies. So I point that out because, again, a very small amount of copies, and I like saying Thucydides. Because it's just kind of fun and it makes you sound intelligent, even though I don't know much about the guy. <laughs> Let's compare that now to the New Testament writings. Greek New Testament manuscripts written from about 50, 40 or 50 to about 100 AD. There's only a 50 year interval from the original writings to when we have copies. And how many copies do we have? We have over 5,800 manuscripts for the Greek New Testament. Then we take a look at the Greek New Testament early translations when they were translating it. We're not going to go over the original dates in the interval because they were translated at different times. We're going to focus, though, on how many copies we have. We have over 18,000 copies of those early translations. And then we take a look at the Old Testament manuscripts. We have 42,000 manuscripts of the Old Testament. So in all total of the Bible, Biblical manuscripts, we have over 66,000 copies. Compare that to Homer's Iliad, we have only 1,800 copies. There's so much more evidence for the copies of the New Testament and the Old Testament that we have today that was copied accurately than any other writing in history. If you're going to doubt the Bible, you have to throw out every other ancient writing because the Bible is better attested from the bibliographical test than any other writing in history. And here's just a simple exercise of how this works. We're going to take a look at Philippians 2.5. Let's say we found three manuscripts of Philippians 2.5. We're trying to figure out what it actually says. What was the original? Well, let's say manuscript A states, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Manuscript B said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Jesus Christ. The last two words are flipped. The meaning's the same, but the last two words are switched. Third one says, let the mind be in you, which was also of Christ Jesus. Pretty much means the same thing, but it's worded a little differently. How would we know which of these was the original by these three variations? We wouldn't. We couldn't possibly know. But what if we had double this amount? What if we had six copies and we noticed that four of them were basically identical. One exception is this very last one has a, a very minor spelling error. Otherwise, they're identical. Then we could be pretty confident that we can real, rule out the second and third one here, and we know what the original one was because we have more manuscripts to check. Well, now imagine not just having six, but having tens or hundreds of manuscripts for passages and verses or thousands for the Bible in total. You could be very confident that what you have today is what was originally written, and that's how this works. And we keep finding more. This is Discover the Evidence Conference in December 2013. Over 250 scholars and leaders had gathered. I was fortunate to be invited to that, so I was down there. And it included artifacts that were from 1,500 to 2,200 years old, and it also included these Egyptian burial masks. These things are kind of like paper mache the way that they're made. Well, what they found out as they were taking some apart, 
they actually had ancient manuscripts that were used to make these burial masks. So they're taking them apart, finding these manuscripts. There were 200 biblical and classical fragments discovered. This is just at the conference we did. They had found a lot more prior to the conference, but at the conference itself, they uncovered another 200 biblical and classical fragments, which included six passages from the New Testament and one from the Old Testament, further confirming that what we have today is accurate. And again, they just keep finding more and more of these types of evidences. Here's an interesting point. Even if every Bible today were destroyed, we could reconstruct the entire New Testament with the exception of just 11 verses solely by using quotations from early church fathers within the first few hundred years after Christ. That's amazing. Destroy all the Bibles. There's still enough people that have quoted it early on that we could reconstruct in almost the entire New Testament. It's pretty amazing how God's word has been preserved. Oh, yeah, but you see, these monks got together and they corrupted it purposely to kind of have their own religion and make it say what they wanted it to say. Let's take a look at that a little bit further. Is that plausible at all? This is virtually impossible to purposely corrupt, and here's why. Think about it. First of all, you'd have to change all the existing Greek and Hebrew manuscripts, thousands and thousands of those. These are not Word documents that you can go in and change the typing and do a save as. No, these are Greek in Hebrew manuscripts written in ink to change that without everyone noting, noticing and then get it back and again without being caught. Secondly, you'd have to change all the copies in other languages, Coptic and Syriac, many copies of the Bible in those languages. So you'd have to find all those and change those without being caught. Also, you'd have to change all the early church fathers' commentaries because they wrote about the Bible so much you could pretty much reconstruct the whole thing from their writings. So you'd have to go into their writings and corrupt all those and get them to match up as well. It's just not plausible for this to even happen, and there's no evidence that that's what happened anyway. And imagine if we did have the originals, if somehow the originals could last. Well, you'd probably agree with me, it would be locked up somewhere in some dark castle, and they'd be charging a lot of money for you just to come and see it through some plexiglass. And they would probably also claim that only the originals are the true word of God. Anything else out there is just a fraud. Well, how would the world learn the truth of Scripture if it's locked up in a castle somewhere and no one else could really read it? And whatever you do have, they say, well, that one doesn't count. It doesn't have the actual power of God. But if you want to come here and see it, you'll get a special blessing from God. But you're going to have to pay a lot of money. I'm sure that's exactly what would happen is if, if we had the original copies here. God's pretty sharp. And he knew it would be much better to make thousands and thousands of copies to be spread around the world for all to share, enjoy, and benefit from. We will end the introductory part here talking about the miraculous survival of the Bible, how it survived throughout history. It's been stated that the Bible is an anvil that has worn out many a hammer. Many attempts have been made to destroy God's word and wipe it off the face of the earth but it's hung around. It's survived just like God has promised. We have Antiochus Epiphanes. He was Greek king of the Seleucid Empire from 175 to 164 BC. It was stated that if there were any sacred book of the law found, it was destroyed, and those Jews with whom they were found miserably perished also. You did not want to be caught with a copy of the Word of God back then because they would not only take it away and destroy it, but you would be killed for that. So it's amazing that the Bible survived that time in history. Then we have Diocletian, Roman Empire, 284 to 305 AD. Royal edicts were published everywhere, commanding that the church, churches be leveled to the ground and the scriptures be destroyed by fire. Again, caught with a Bible, it's destroyed. They're destroying churches and all that. A vicious attack on God's word to wipe it from the face of the earth. Two years after issuing this edict, he stated, I have completely exterminated the Christian writings from the face of the earth. Well, not quite. It not only survived, but it thrived. The miraculous survival, the French philosopher and infidel Voltaire from 1694 to 1778, he said, 100 years from my day, there will not be a Bible in the earth except one that is looked upon by an antiquarian curiosity seeker. He made that claim. Well, you know what? He's gone. 
and the Bible is still around uh, better than ever. Now, this is one of my favorite myths. Here's how the myth goes. Within 50 years of Voltaire's death, the Geneva Bible Society used his house and his printing presses to produce thousands of Bibles, specifically French New Testaments. I heard that years ago, and I thought, that's awesome. He said the Bible was going away, but his name would live on in infamy. He's gone, and they used his own house and his presses to produce more Bibles. That'd be a great story. Apparently, it's not actually true. I did some more research on it, and it's just kind of a nice fable. I wish it was true, but apparently it's not, but it, it is one of my favorite myths. <laughs> that leads us to talking about the Dark Ages and beyond, what was going on, attacks on God's Word during this period of time. Bible reading and translations were banned during the Dark Ages and beyond. 1215, Pope Innocent III issued a law that they shall be seized for trial and penalties who engage in the translation of the sacred volumes or who hold secret meetings or who assume the office of preaching without the authority of their superiors against whom process shall be commenced without any permission or appeal. You couldn't read God's word, you couldn't preach on it without special permission. 1215 again, furthermore he declared that as by the old law, the beast touching the holy mount was to be stoned to death, so simple and uneducated men were not to touch the Bible or venture to preach its doctrines. So you weren't supposed to touch the Bible and you weren't allowed to preach on it because you're, you're too simple. You didn't know better. You had to rely on the magisterium to tell you what God's word actually meant. 1546, Council of Trent placed translations of the Bible on its list of prohibited books and forbade any person to read the Bible without a license from a Catholic bishop or inquisitor. You needed a license to be reading and preaching this thing. Again, they really controlled the whole thing. Uh, first, they tried to destroy things, and now they're just trying to control it, that they are the ones that you have to look to to find out this truth, because you're not going to be able to figure that out on your own. These prohibitions were added to the Index of Prohibited Books and were continually reaffirmed by popes right up through the 19th century. And then we have John Wycliffe. He's considered the father of the English Bible. He was persecuted greatly by the Catholic Church, so much so that 43 years after his death, the Roman Catholic Church dug up his bones, burned them, and threw them, his ashes into the River Swift. It's how much they hated this guy, for translating the Bible in common English so that the common person could read that. They're like, no, 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 we will read it and we will teach it in Latin or whatever. Again, kind of a control thing here. They didn't like the fact that he was making it accessible to the common person. Then we have William Tyndale. He's a brilliant translator, knew seven languages. He said, Christ desires his mysteries to be published abroad as widely as possible. I would that the Gospels and the Epistles of Paul were translated into all languages of all Christian people and that they might be read and known. I defy the Pope and all his laws. If God spare my life ere many years, I will cause a boy who drives a plow to know more of the scriptures than you do. <laughs> that was pretty bold of him to say that, and you can imagine that didn't go over very well. The commissioners of the Holy Roman Empire convicted him of heresy, and in August 1536, he was burned at the stake. Shortly before his execution, he cried out, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. Well, fortunately, that prayer was answered. Two years later, King Henry VIII ordered the Bible of Miles Coverdale was to be used in every parish in the land. So again, a tax on God's word, but once again, God's word prevails. Isaiah 48 says, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of God shall stand forever. In Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. The word of God is living and powerful, and it has withstood the test of time, even when great efforts were made to wipe it off the face of the earth. That brings us to the end of our introductory part. We're going to be getting into some of those evidences now. Of how do we know that it's actually the inspired word of God? We'll be looking at four categories of evidence. We're going to look at two of them in one session. 
because they're pretty simple to understand. You'll get the gist of it pretty quickly, and then we'll reserve a separate session for when we look at prophetic accuracy and scientific accuracy. We're just kind of getting warmed up. We appreciate you being with us, and we look forward to seeing you in session number three. We hope you enjoyed this presentation and trust it was an encouragement to you. For more information about our ministry and resources, visit us online at thestartingpointproject.com.